last several Sunday mornings been speaking on the subject of gifts, and we're going to change gears a little bit. been talking about things that God has given to us, and uh, just with the Christmas season, just, you know, I've mentioned this before, usually for different service times have different attitudes or personalities. Usually on a Sunday morning service, that's when you're most likely to have visitors come, and not just visitors, but people that may not know Christ as their Savior. So most, so not always, but on a lot of Sunday mornings, the message would be more evangelistic, more salvation geared. Sunday night and Wednesday nights, um, usually are more of our faithful people that come no matter what, um, even when things are awkward, like you don't have a pianist. Um, but, uh, you know, people uh, usually come, uh, the faithful ones would come for those things, uh, those that are able to come all the time. And those would be more teaching and, and more harder preaching, I guess, for the Christian life. Um, but this morning, I wanted to deal, we're going to not so much deal primarily with the issue of salvation, but as saved people, as Christians, what we should do with what God gives us. So where we've dealt with the issue of uh, eternal life and grace for God's gifts, I want to deal with the issue of spiritual gifts. Um, depending on what kind of church background you're from, uh, would greatly vary as far as what you would hear about the teaching you're going to hear this morning. Um, but I want us to get at least a, a few basic truths from this passage. So this will be a lot more teaching, more than preaching, I guess. Um, but follow along with me and follow, read with me, page, um, so Romans chapter 12. And while we'll deal with this entire chapter this morning quickly, um, we'll just read verses 1 through 6 together, then we'll pray and we'll dive into the message this morning. All right, Romans 12. Romans 12 and verse number 1. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts, differing according to the grace given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. We'll stop there reading for now, but in verse, the first three words are verse number six, having then gifts. This morning I'll speak on the subject of our spiritual gifts that God has given us and what we're supposed to do with them. Spiritual gifts. Father, thank you for your word. God, I thank you for teaching more in-depth truths. And God, I thank you that there's things in your word that I'm definitely still learning. God, if I knew everything, um, I have no more room to grow. And God, I thank you that when I get to heaven, I'll be learning more. <laughs> and God, I thank you for the depth and the riches of the Scriptures. And Lord, would you be our teacher, Holy Spirit, in order for me to explain these things in a way that would be helpful, I need you to make application and turn the light on for us so we can see truth, open our ears and our eyes. And God, I pray for anyone that's here this morning that's never been saved, that they would, number one, understand their need for salvation, the need for the forgiveness of sins, and believe in faith that you died for them and you will save them if they would simply put their faith in you. But God, those of us that are saved, may we take the truth this morning and learn to be giving Christians by taking what you've given us and using it for your glory. God, help us and may we give a, have a greater desire for truth. I pray in Jesus' name, asking for your help. Amen. <laughs> We know this by now, uh, Christmas, it's the season for giving. I, you know, I, um, I, I enjoy seeing my kids on Christmas morning um, multiple times in my house, in my parents' house, my parents' house again, getting, letting them, or getting to see my children open up the gifts that we bought them and other people got for them and them being so excited. Uh, one of my kids especially, all of them are good at it, I guess, but one of my kids gets really excited about every little present. It doesn't matter what it is, but she gets really excited. And that's, that's fun to see someone, you know, at least one of my kids being extremely thankful. But it's, again, with the season of giving, it's not just a season for shopping. Um, praise the Lord for that. I hate shopping. Everybody with me? Most guys, right? You, we, we buy. We don't shop. But anyways, um, I, I, I don't like that part of, of the Christmas season. Thankfully, Jessica does almost all of it. Um, but Christmas is a time for giving, and not just money, and not just things, but giving of ourselves, uh, expressing love for other people, 
But again, we've talked about this the last few weeks, but the greatest gift that was ever given is what we celebrate in Christmas. It's Christ. It's Jesus Christ. A uh, great verse about that, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We understand that, right? Uh, God the Father gave His Son, Jesus, to us. So we can have eternal life, we can be saved, we can go to heaven because God saw fit to give us Jesus Christ. So we have the gift of Jesus Christ um, uh, given to us at Christmas, but then the last couple uh, weeks we saw, I uh, mentioned a minute ago, we, have number, we saw God as the great gift giver. Um, in James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God is, was, and always will be a faithful and giving God. He give, every good thing we have in life is because God gave it to us. So we have a good God who gives us good things. But then we saw one of the gifts that He gave is eternal life for the wages of sin is death. What we deserve for our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're saved, you have that right now. You, you don't start it when you die. You've already gotten it. If you trusted Christ, you were born again, and that new life that you started is eternal. It's forever. So you have eternal life dwelling in you. But then not only did God give you eternal life, but Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So because of Christ... God offers grace, right? So grace is what God can do. We talked about that last week. If you, how many of you were here last week? You remember that, at least a little bit of it. We talked about grace. So God gives us grace. We're saved by grace. You cannot be saved on your own. Sunday school was great. It was about that. Um, God, I was thinking about some other things that I want to talk to you about later. It was really helpful to me. It stood out in the lesson, but it was good. But anyways, uh, be here for Sunday school next week. Uh, but grace, God's divine enablement, God's divine favor, God gives us His grace. The only reason you can go to heaven is because God is a gracious God. And how do we get grace? How do we get God's favor, God's goodness, God's ability to go to heaven? By faith. The moment you put your faith in Jesus to save you, you immediately receive His grace. But we talked about this fact as well. Grace is not just to go to heaven. Grace is to live the Christian life. God's grace is a strengthening for dealing with trouble. God's grace is strengthening to do His work. God's grace does a lot of things for us. Well, that grace kicks in with a lesson as well that we'll talk about this morning. But grace is God's divine favor and enablement. Jesus, through His shed blood on the cross, paid the price for it. He died in our place so we can be saved and have that relationship with God and have His, His ability. God's ability is far superior than our ability, isn't it? God's grace is a wonderful thing. He enables us to live the Christian life. I don't know who it was, but someone wisely said, though, the happiest people on earth are the people who have discovered the joy of giving. Giving is not just about getting. <laughs> we enjoy the other people giving, but we, us giving back to God, and if you're already feeling a little bit uptight about that statement, I'm not intending to talk about money, although we could, um, but uh, that's, that's very, very little what we're going to talk about this morning. But in Romans 12, it talks about giving. It deals with three different phases of giving that we'll talk about um, with giving. In Romans 12, we find this important teaching on giving to God, giving our life to God, giving back to Him. It deals with us giving back to God and then God giving to us and then us giving what we have for the benefit of others, all right? Now, I want, you, I want to show you a couple of verses, and a couple of passages that deal with the issue of spiritual gifts. Go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, there's three passages that are really helpful with spiritual gifts. Number one, Romans 12. Secondly, 1 Corinthians 12. And then thirdly, Ephesians 4. There's other passages that deal with this, and again, there's different denominations and belief systems that take these verses and maybe make them say some other things or leave out some other, other verses. Um, we won't get into why we're, not, uh, why we're not Pentecostal, why we're not charismatic. That's not the thought for this morning. Um, I just want to share with you some truths that, that apply to us today. But in 1 Corinthians 12... We won't read the whole chapter, but I want you to, but I want to read several parts of this together. 1 Corinthians 12, and beginning in verse number 4. Again, this will be a lot more teaching, so I encourage you to write some things down, especially if you've never heard this, these thoughts before. It's not new. It's been in the Bible for 2,000 years, um, but, but maybe you've not discovered it yet. But 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, 
but is the same God which worketh all in all. Time out for just a second. Look this way. So he deals with there's gifts and administrations and operations. In a second, we'll see a list of different we could call gifts. Other people would call gifts. I believe it's these three things mixed in. Um, there's, uh, there's gifts. There's an ability that God gives. There's administrations. There's an office to use that. So if I'm a pastor, or for example, the gift of prophecy, what would you call a person that definitely had the gift of prophecy in the Bible? Uh, Prophet, right? So he had the administration of a prophet, right? So there's that. And then there's, uh, there's operations. There's, you have this gift, and with that gift, you use it in a certain way, a more specific way, right? So if a prophet had the gift of prophecy, and what would he do with it? What was the operation? He would prophesy, right? Make sense? All right. A prophet had the gift of prophecy, and he would prophesy. There's the administration, there's the gift, and there's the operation, all right? So anyways... Not all, of the, not all of them are that clear cut. So anyways, verse number seven. But the manifestation of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Those two words are very important. Why, why, why are they given to profit with all? You don't use that word with all very often, but the per, or probably ever, but the word with all means for everyone's benefit. So why does God gift you? To profit everyone around you. So that's what spiritual gifts are for, to profit with all, to profit everyone. And Paul, talking to this local church there, says it's for the benefit of your church. Verse 8, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another divers kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one that one and the self-same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Again, I want you to remember that last phrase. Dividing to every man severally as he will. So there's gifts. There's ways you use the gifts. They're for everyone's benefit. But he divides to everyone severally as he will. In other words, every one of you have one, at least one. Every Christian is gifted. Does that make sense? God has divided them several days. He will. He says, I think Jay needs this gift. I think Annie needs this gift. I think Eden needs this gift. I think John Howe needs this gift. God says, this is, this is what I made you for. This is what I put in your life. I'm going to gift you in this way for the benefit of other Christians. So let's skip down a little bit more to, to, ch- to same chapter, but verse 24. So the whole chapter is important, but for time's sake, we won't read all of it. Skip to verse 24 or 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 24. It says, for our comely parts, so dealing with um, church body parts. <laughs> is, that's kind of a weird way to say it, but that's the illustration. As a body, a church body has different members, body parts. So I don't know what I would be, but some of you would be a hand, some of you would be a foot, some of you would be a tinky, a, a tinky, toe, a tinky toe, a pinky toe, I don't know. But we'd all be a brain or whatever. We'd all be different body parts. Verse 24, for our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there be no schism in the body but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, and all, members, all, member, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And that last chunk of, last passage I read deals with one major thought, or I guess a couple different major thoughts. You're all, not only are you all gifted, but you are all important. We're not all the same. Not everyone, though there's certain, though there's truths that apply to everybody and commands that apply to everybody, dealing with spiritual gifts, God does not, we're not all the exact same. Not all of us have the same abilities, the same personality, the same upbringing, or same future. We all are slightly different in some ways. So God takes all of these body parts with different functions and abilities and puts them together. Some may be more attractive than others, but it doesn't matter. And the kind of the truth that we read in the first verse, probably the most attractive would probably be the least important. So that's, that's always fun for us. So when we think we're big and important, maybe not. But anyways, but we are, all, we are all vital for the work of God to go forward. So the whole point so far, God has gifted every saved person for the benefit 
of the church body, and we are all important. We're all gifts. We are all gifted by God to serve Him with. I want to give you th- this. That will overlap with what I'm about, with the three points that I'm going to give you. But number one, again, our number one, our gift to God. So with that context in mind, spiritual gifts, how God has blessed us and gifted us to serve Him. Now let's go back to Romans 12, which deals with the same issue, but in slightly different wording. In Romans 12, which is all about spiritual gifts, it begins with verses 1 and 2. So with gifts in mind, and we'll get to the more gift verses in later in Romans 12, he says, Romans 12, verse 1, Before he gets the gifts, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Before he deals with what God gives you, God deals with a gift that you give to him. I think it's kind of interesting. There's a synonym that we would use for gifts. What would it be? Search with a P. A present. Right? You, by the mercy of God that ye present your bodies. <laughs> you present. That's the same concept. You're giving to God. You're presenting. God, I have this thing I'm going to give you. I'm presenting to you my body, a living sacrifice. So number one, dealing with the issue of spiritual gifts, we find number one, our gift to God. God tells you, in fact, in verse one, he begs you. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, Christians, brethren, sisters in Christ, I'm begging you, I'm beseeching you, I'm asking you to do something. I want you to give a gift to God. What is it that God is asking from you? What does God want from you? You. God wants you from you. He wants all of you. But here he says your body is a living sacrifice. So before you can get your gifts, and this is an important truth, before you can understand and get your gifts right and use your gifts right, you first must give you to God. You'll never use spiritual gifts properly unless they're under the control of God. That's an important thing. We're all blessed by God, but there's lots of people that are saved and spiritually gifted, but they do not use their gifts right or do not use their gifts at all because God does not have control of their life. By the way, we call them spiritual gifts because they're spiritual. If you ain't spiritual, you ain't going to use your spiritual gifts very spiritually. Doesn't that make sense, right? God says, give me you so I can use you. So present your bodies a living sacrifice. You need to come to the understanding that you belong to God, all of you, top of the head to the bottom of the feet, inside, outside, all of you belongs to God, your spirit, your soul, your body that belongs to God. We we often deal, we sometimes struggle with emotions, our soul, we we often deal with our bodies too, fight with our bodies, our fleshly cravings, desires, whether it's a a lustful desire or a lazy desire or whatever, We we have problems and God says, give me you. What kind of gift to God? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What kind of gift is acceptable to God? A holy gift. That's, a, that's an amazing thought, thinking of giving God something as great and wonderful as God is. How many of you, you don't raise your hand, but uh, you, some of you may have felt like I did this week. Family members have spent lots of money on you, and you ain't got that kind of money, right? And you, you're right, you get really nice gifts, and you're like, you know, I feel awkward and bad and embarrassed. Maybe it's pride in me, but, you know, you feel embarrassed because they gave you something so nice, and you just couldn't afford it. Anyone else feel that way? Right, sometimes I do. Um, with, with gifts, you know, or sometimes you know they gave more thought than, than you did, right? Ex- and a gift that's acceptable to God, something that would please God. That's a high, lofty thought. But God says give a holy gift, yourself as holy, meaning pure and spotless and separated from sin and separated to, for God's purpose, meaning untainted, undefiled. Living a life of practical holiness is what God wants from you. Practical holiness, not just I pretend to be spiritual, but I don't allow the junk of this filthy, nasty, sinful world in my heart and in my mind and in my life. I don't do that. I don't, and it's not about pride, but I, I don't talk that way. I don't act, you, you make those decisions. I'm not going to live that way. Living a life of practical holiness and living a life of unworldliness, meaning holiness deals with separation, meaning I'm trying to be like God. I'm not trying to be like everything else. I'm not trying to be like everyone else. I'm not going to go with the flow of the world. I'm going to follow the Lord. A holy gift. And then in verse number three, 
Well, he continues, verse 2, be not conformed to this world. There's the worldliness issue. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You get in line with the Word of God. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Then verse 3, not only holy, but humble. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. You know, it's hard sometimes with people that are really gifted. They think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. (laughs) They think, I'm uber talented, so let me show off my talents. Before he gets to the gifts, he says, give it to God. Before he gets to the gifts, he said, don't be prideful. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Don't get the big head. (laughs) So our gift to God, a holy and humble gift. But again, it belongs to God. I read this. I thought it was kind of funny. The Butterball Turkey Company, years ago, they set up a, a, a telephone hotline. Now you just got to go to the website. But anyways, I'd imagine. But they, they set up a hotline for, to help people know how to, to cook a turkey. So one woman, she called uh, and asked about cooking a turkey that she had, the bo- she had in the bottom of her freezer for 23 years. So the representative on the phone said, you know, yes, it is edible. You probably won't die as long as you kept the turkey below zero degrees consistently for all those 23 years. Uh, But if you did that, it's probably safe. But either way, even if you did do that, it's not going to taste right. It's going to have like no flavor. You probably don't want to eat it, and we wouldn't recommend it. So the caller said, okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. I'll just give it to my church. Right. Uh, (laughs) Right. Sometimes that's how it goes, right? I'll give to God that. No, that's not what God's looking for. God is looking for you to give all of you completely to the Lord, your best, your holy and humble gift to God. So number one, our gift to God. Number two, our gift from God. Look at verse number four. Romans 12, four. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. In other words, every member, that's a biblical terminology, church membership. Some churches don't believe in that. That's completely biblical to have church membership. Here's a verse that talks about it. For as we have many members in one body, all members have not the same office. We're all different, serve different purposes. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, and he gives a list of seven gifts or categories of gifts, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. By the way, time out for just a second. The wait, let us wait on doesn't mean do it later. It's like if you're waiting tables about serving others. That's the kind of waiting that it's talking about. So let us, let us be occupied with, distracted by, serving with. Let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So he gives a list of seven gifts. So here's our gifts to God. I'm sorry, our gifts from God. He, he lists these seven gifts that we all have, at least one of them. Again, one, many members in one body, all members have not the same office. The church body is given gifts, and not everyone is made the same, and not every one of you is to do the same thing. We saw this a few minutes ago in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but all these worketh that one and self-same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. So the Holy Spirit has given out gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 and 28, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after the miracles, the gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. So every biblical church is a body. Grace Baptist, you may not have ever used this terminology, but this is biblical terminology. Grace Baptist Church is a body of Christ. This is a church body. We have members, people in membership. There's people that just attend. They may be faithful. But a church, you find this in 1 Corinthians and Romans and in the book of Acts, a church allows people to join. So we have people that faithfully attend, but then we have church that people that have joined through baptism or transfer letter or something like that. There are people that are members of our church. That's what it's talking about. And God has set people in the church, and God sets them there, leads them there for different reasons to serve whether it's leadership abilities, teaching abilities, maybe you're just an encouragement. Some people will never, ever, ever stand up in front of people and teach a lesson. But they teach behind the scenes, they love, they invest, they reach out to people. 
you are all useful. Our church will only function properly as everyone uses their gifts. And some of you, no one will ever know what gifts you have because you don't talk about it and people may not recognize it, but God is using you. And you're important, you're vital. Some are to encourage, some are to organize, some are just, sometimes just grunt work. Sometimes I just, sometimes I feel like I'd rather just be behind the scenes doing stuff that no one knows and I'd just rather work. But, you know, sometimes we feel that way, but some are great at sharing the gospel. Some are much more compassionate. Some are a bit more cold and heartless like I am. But, but we're all different. We have different uses. But you're gifted by God. Again, and if you're going to be used of God to use the gift that God wants you to use, you have to be faithful, serving the Lord, close to the Lord, growing. That's important. But He gives those gifts. You're all gifted. And then He gives a, a list of them. When we get to verse, where are we at? Verse number 6. What I'm going to do, it's going to be a little bit weird, but when I get to the Word, I'm going to have you repeat the name of the gift after me. And I give you seven gifts. So I like to, to, nail, to nail things down, right? So there's different lists in the Bible as far as what are the gifts. But I think in Romans 12 is the most concise gift, which is seven, which that doesn't always mean anything. Sometimes it's helpful, the number of completion, whatever. But anyways, I believe these, uh, these are the seven gifts. But underneath these gifts could be other operations. We talked about that. So anyways, verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace given to us, whether prophecy. Whether what? Prophecy. So that's gift number one, prophecy. Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry. Ministry. Let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth. So teaching. On teaching. Or he that exhorteth. Exhortation. Exhorting. Whatever you want to say. It's hard when we're all saying different uh, ending of the word. On exhortation. He that giveth. So giving. What's that gift? Giving. All right. Let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth. So the gift of ruling. The gift of ruling. With diligence. He that showeth mercy, the gift of mercy. The gift of what? Mercy with cheerfulness. So here we find seven gifts. There's the gift of prophecy, the gift of ministry, the gift of teaching, the gift of exhortation or exhorting, the gift of giving, the gift of ruling, the gift of mercy. Prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving, ruling, and mercy. Let me kind of define these gifts as simply as possible. And then we'll move on to the third and last part of the message. So these are the gifts from God, the gift of prophecy. This one's pretty clear. Think of the Old Testament, or even parts of the New Testament, what a prophet was. Somebody name a prophet. Good, Jeremiah. Right, there's Isaiah, there's Jeremiah, John, and these guys. They would, what, what was their job? To hear the Word of God and give the Word of God. To declare to people the Word of God. In the Old Testament especially, we think of the books of prophecy, Isaiah, Jeremiah, you know, some of those books. They would hear a new message from God and declare that, that message. They were to sound forth the Word of God. Now we have the completed Word of God. So what does a prophet do? We're not getting new revelation from God, but we're telling people what the Word of God says. The job hasn't changed. We're just not, rather than hearing new stuff, we're, we're getting this stuff, right? So we're giving, we're declaring the Word of God. So a prophet is someone who boldly declares the Word of God. They just give out, they prophesy, they give out the Word of God. So, a, so that's what a prophet is. A minister, we can think of a minister like a pastor kind of, but the word minister means to serve. Serving and enabling others to do the work of God. That's what a minister is, to serve others and help others do the work of God. There's lots of ways that can be done, just, but just helping people do God's work. And then there's the gift of teaching. I think we probably understand what the word teaching means, but uh, to express the truth in a helpful way. Sometimes a preacher can just say, this is what God said, like it or lump it, and you just say what it says. Teaching is more so kind of what this says or what we're doing this morning, just slowly explaining, connecting the dots and things like that. There's a difference between preaching and teaching. Prophecy, prophecy is more preaching, teaching is teaching, right? Some more slow, again, it's more than just speed, but, um, but more explaining as opposed to just declaring. Then the gift of exhortation, to exhort us to build up others, an encourager. Some people, again, they may not stand in front of people, but they encourage. They visit, they talk, they write notes, they call, they text. They just want to keep people happy in the Lord. That's highly valuable. We all need those. And then next, the gift of giving. Sometimes people need to help up. 
And it's not always, sometimes it is money. Some, some people are just blessed, with, blessed by God with money and they use what they have just to give back. Some people are blessed with money, but they don't do anything with it. But they don't have a giving heart. But the gift of giving is time, it's sacrifice, it's your energy or whatever you have to give to help the work of God go forward. Everyone should give, but there's the gift of giving to, to, to lessen the burdens of others. Then the gift of ruling, to rule over means organizing, to guide, adding structure, delegation, whatever, to help, to help the work of God in an, an administration type gift. And then the gift of mercy, so being compassionate. What's kind of interesting is, the, is the, the, the ends of the spectrum. The gift of mercy and the gift of a prophet, they're kind of different. <laughs> they're kind of opposite ends, but we need all of them. Some people, sometimes you just need someone to tell you what you need to hear, or not what, what you want to hear, but sometimes you just need to tell, people need to hear the truth, whether you like it or not. You just need to be told, this is the way it is. Sometimes we need someone just to listen and to cry with us and to, to care, right? They're all valuable. They're different. Which one's more important? They're all of equal value. But there's these gifts. So, number one, our gift to God. Give yourself to God. Let Him control you. Number two, there's these gifts Prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving, ruling, mercy. By the way, let me say this on a side note. The gift of prophecy, this is some people, people might ask, what about the gift of, of tongues, for example, or the gift of new revelation? That happened in the times of Scripture. Again, 1 Corinthians 13, I believe, declares that the gift of tongues ceased when that which is perfect has come. The Bible is the only perfect thing that's ever existed. Jesus was a perfect person. The Bible is a perfect thing. So when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part should be done away. First Corinthians 13, I believe tongues cease, but tongues had a purpose. Tongues was, was an aid in prophecy, getting the Word of God to people that could not understand. What was the gift of knowledge and, this, and the special wisdom? Hearing information from God It was a type of prophecy. So remember the administration's operations, those gifts and those ways those gifts were used. Does that make sense? Okay. So, thirdly, we find our gift to God's children. What happens if you use those gifts? How will it help? Not only will people hear more information, not only will people feel loved, but I love, and it's just a list of things, and we're, I just want to read them, and I'll kind of make some comments as we go. But what happens if you and everyone in our church give ourselves to God, Allow God to control us. We use our gifts. Verse number 9. These are the results, I believe, of, spiritually, of spiritual gifts being used. Let love be without dissimulation. In other words, not being fake. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Time out for just a second. Think of a group of people that there's genuine love for, for one another. Yes, they abhor that which is evil, but they cleave to that which is good. They're, they're not compromising. They're not going to lie to you and tell you you're doing fine when you're living in vile sin, but they're going to love you and they're going to care about you and they're going to be kind to you with brotherly love and they're going to prefer you above themselves. Isn't that, isn't that the kind of church that you want to be a part of? That's what happens when spiritual people use their spiritual gifts. But it continues, not slothful in business, so they're hardworking. Fervent in spirit, there's, uh, there's on fire for the Lord, there's fervency there. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Yeah, they go through stuff, but they're patient through it. God sees them through it, and they know that God's there with them. Continuing instant in prayer. When there's a need, they can go to God about it. Distributing to the necessity of saints. Hey, look, there's giving. There's a need, and they'll give to it. They'll help. Given to hospitality, they'll welcome you in. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. That sure sounds like mercy to me. Be of the same mind one toward another. How, how does that happen by teaching and preaching and bringing people along? Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. You reach down to people. Be not wise in thine own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. In other words, someone does you wrong, you yield. You give into it. 
Pastor, we shouldn't be pushovers, right, in some ways. But sometimes when people do you wrong, you just keep your mouth shut. You let it go. Why? For it is written, vengeance is, mine's, vengeance is mine, I will repay. God never gives any human being the right to repay, to be vengeful. None. You don't have the right to do that. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. And for in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. I know we just ran through them. If we read those again and again, it's challenging to think, that's the kind of godly character that I'm supposed to have. But not only is it what I should have, but if I give myself to God, and if you give yourself to God, Lord, control me, guide my words, guide my actions, speak to my heart and show me how I can live for you and guide me to opportunities to live for you. God, I give myself to you. Whatever you enable me to do by your grace, whatever you enable me to do, I'll do it. And as God blesses you and guides you and you just by faith trust God to, live, to, to help you do what He tells you to do, as you just obey God by faith, those spiritual gifts will be used and that high standards of godly living that's what our church will be. Patient and kind and encouraging one another and helping one another. You want to, you want to know why those things are not in my life all the time? Because I'm not, in that moment at least, I've not given myself to God. Because of the gift that God has enabled me to use, I'm not using it. God has gifted you. So use that gift for God, but for the benefit of others. That's what God fully expects us to do. Imagine a church full of people that are patient and giving and kind and forgiving and helpful and listening and serving and united. That's a, gift, that's a, a church using their spiritual gifts. I read this story and I'll be done. In Kentucky, years ago, there was a family of about 35 people, kids and grandkids and all that kind of stuff. and They had a tradition every year. At Christmas, where uh, the the, grand, the great grandpa, he was the one, he would sit down, he'd read the Christmas story, and you know he'd read Luke two or whatever, he'd read it slow and clear and deliberate, and the kids would fidget around and patiently, but he didn't care, you know, uh, he just make sure he read the Christmas story clearly and maybe make a few comments, and then he'd pray with the family and thank God for the gifts and thank God for for Jesus Christ, and then that great grandpa after the prayer was given, and then it was time for get for the presents. So he would, one at a time, just wouldn't be a big hurried thing. He'd just one gift at a time, hand out the gifts, and he'd kind of enjoy his gift giving as he'd be the Santa Claus type thing. And, but one year he'd, you know, handed out a gift, one to John and one to Mary or whatever, and he called out all the names, but he was decided to play a trick on one of his grandkids. And, you know, this one's to you and this one's to you. And then when he got to that kid, he took the gift and hid it behind the tree and kept on going and hid his gift behind the tree just to be funny, you know, and they get to the end, and he looks over, and that great-grandchild is there crying, <laughs> granddaddy, is there anything for me? He thought it was a, the grandpa thought it was kind of a funny joke, but it, the kid didn't take it that way, he was, thought he got left out for that Christmas, and I read that, and I was thinking, what did Jesus Christ get from you? What should he get from you, and not just at Christmas time, but I wonder sometimes if Jesus is, so to say, sitting in the chair. Everyone else is getting a gift, but what about me? Do they think? Do they forget me this year? God expects. Uh, God blesses us. It's like as if the child bought all the gifts. That'd make a better illustration, right? But God is the great gift giver. He's given you salvation, eternal life. He's given you grace, not only to go to heaven, but to live for Him. And by that grace, you use the gifts, the abilities, the talents that God has given you. Now God wants you to serve Him. And again, this, it's, it's not, about, not just about money. Maybe money is part of it, but it's not about money. It's not about things. It's give your life to God. God, you've blessed me so much. I give myself back to you because He's worthy, because He saved your wicked, rotten soul. And He wants to use you, and God can do wonderful things with you if you'll just surrender yourself to Him. Are you giving your life to God? I, about two years ago, probably, I printed this out, and I think on a card, and left it at the back table. And it's ministry enlistment. 
It just says a couple different things. I've trusted Christ. I've been baptized. I'm a faithful member of the church. And it says, I believe God would have me serve in. And there's a list of about 15, 20 <laughs> ministries. We're all supposed to witness. We're all supposed to pray. We're all supposed to faithfully attend church. We're all supposed to sing and worship together. We're all supposed to give. And there's things you can do behind the scenes, cooking and serving and visiting and calling one another and praying for one another. But there's a list of other ministries that are avenues to use your spiritual gifts. Maybe no one would ever see you, but you don't care. You just want to serve God. Maybe the gifting that God gives you is to teach. You think, I could never do that. 20 years ago, I never thought I'd ever teach, preach, anything like that. Scared to death. You never know what God, what God might help you do if you just say, God, I'll do it. But give yourself to the Lord and use the gift that God has given you for the benefit of His people.